one started out as a crude, had all kinds of uh, really nasty things in it called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So there's 17 of those things which are really nasty. There's about a thousand of them that exist. But they're called aromatics for one reason. They are aromatic. You can smell them in most cases. And they, and they, they vent off, they gas off very easily, especially when they're heated. So what happens is the stuff comes ashore. It's been in the, in the cooler water. It hasn't necessarily been exposed directly to oxygen on a, on a uh, frequent basis because it keeps getting wet. And it absorbs the water. And so once it gets ashore and it gets kind of rolled up in the sand, it dries slowly. When the sun comes out the next day, it really dries fast. So the core exit has sulfur salts as one of its main ingredients. And the sulfur salts have an influence on the fluorescent signature of the crude core exit compound. So that's actually very important because the sulfur can do two things for us. First of all, it gives us a distinct fluorescing color. Second of all, it has its own isotopic signature. So if you put core exit into uh, an isotopic ratio mass spectrometer, an IRMS, and you put seawater in an IRMS, and you put crude oil in an IRMS, you will get three different concentrations of the del 34 sulfur. You can, in theory, prove without having to figure out the hydrocarbon fingerprints that something that has core exit in it came from the Mississippi Canyon 252 wellhead, because that's the only place they were injecting core exit at 5,000 feet below the surface of the ocean. So therefore, if you get this stuff, and we slapped it in an RMS, and we get the proper del 34s signature, it is fingerprinted. It didn't come from anywhere else, because no one else had, a, had authorization to use core exit, period. The core exit has an influence on the oil. If you see it, it will fluoresce orange. And OK, now we can take a sample of that. And we can look for the sulfur in the sample. And if we find it, then that's another indication that we have uh, core exit present, and especially if the sulfur is the proper, if we do an IRMS and we get the proper isotopic signature. Isotope is based on radioactivity. It has nothing to do with anything else but that. And it has a you know, uh, decomposition rate, and that never changes. So that's the nice part about it. You can keep the sample for years, and it's still going to be the same. Everything's going to change at the same rate. So whatever the concentrations level, they're all going on a parallel line down the same path. I know there's oil here. I mean, we can, we can see it. I mean, it looks like oil to me. But it's not behaving like this. So we started thinking about it, and we realized the oil we saw on the bottom had never been on shore. It had never weathered. It had never oxidized. The sulfur had never changed from salt to a sulfur oxide. was there. And it, we took a uh, GCMS, and no kidding, it fingerprinted out to Mississippi Canyon 252 at toxic levels. So what I have a feeling is, is that some of this black stuff that we have here, this asphaltine, is probably non-core exit material. And um, that's what I'm thinking. Because look at the sea slug. You see how the sea slug is so dark? Mm -hmm. We know that's oil, but it's not, uh, but it's not fluorescing because it's never been oxidized. So if this was rolling around on the surf, what in essence we have is non-oxidized oil.
that means from the top to the bottom it's 27 inches of contaminated sediment and it starts to be consistently contaminated at the 14 inch mark the 32 that's 18 inches of consistently homogenized contaminated sand with basically different kinds of layers between 14 and 5 inches so we've got about 9 inches of surface deposition that is going on either by wind or wave run up and even without the UV light you can tell right there is a difference in color between here and here slightly at least I can tell it slightly tanner so I mean it's a it's not only visible in, in ambient light it's also visible in UV light okay so here we have uh, a homogeneous layer of contaminated sand and we'll run this through with the process is called 8272 it's a standard by which the majority of the hydrocarbons that would be uh, at the end of the carbon uh, degradation process would be present not the not the highly volatiles or the semi-volatiles or even any of the aromatic hydrocarbons but some of the long chain carbons um, and if those are there in this sand what they'll do is weigh this they'll figure out the percentage of hydrocarbons in the total weight and then they'll be able to give you a milligrams per cubic meter extrapolation for the concentration and once you have that then you can look at each of the different analytes that they find and be able to by default extrapolate those into their relative percentages and compare them with the uh, NIOSH handbook on whether or not it exceeds any of the exposure limits that are listed therein. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's toxic, it only means that you can compare it against the exposure limits and say that these are below or above that limit, which may or may not be toxic in terms of human health and safety, it's just the limit that they've chosen to put in the book. It's kind of like a speed limit on a road. If, you're, if you exceed it, you get a ticket, so it's a way the government has to find people who are polluting have a pollution level limit and that's how it works. So I took the sample for this hole because it fluoresced orange and it was a fairly thick concentration and we are we have made a hypothesis that the reason it's so thick is because the beach cleanup process was excavating huge amounts of sand putting it through a sifter removing all the big tar balls and then filling up the holes and because this is so thick and it's so deep we, we're making the hypothesis that the only way that it could occur like this is, is for someone to dig a hole and then fill it up with a layer of uh, consistently contaminated sand. And how do you get consistently contaminated sand? Well, you can put it in a sifter, it's like putting it in a blending bowl, and mix it all up, and then it becomes the same consistency in terms of the, the mix. So it's diluted all of the different contaminants in with the cleaner sand to get a level of uh, concentration of the hydrocarbons that would be as, as small as you could get it. In other words, you dilute it as best you can with solid material that's clean. And that's basically their process by which the, the sifter works. Uh, it takes all the sand, no matter whether it's clean or dirty, and it pulverizes the tar balls into submission and mixes them with clean sand and dumps that less contaminated sand back into the hole. And here you have a 27 inch thick layer of contaminated sand. Alright, so here we are at uh, Pensacola Beach right at the uh, access adjacent to Fort Pickens. We're looking for orange to glow and show us where the dispersed oil is and right off the bat it's everywhere everywhere So the trick here isn't going to be where is the oil, it's going to be where is it not. 